Hey, hey everybody, how y'all doing? Cool, that sounds like you guys are doing great. So my name's Kevin, I work at Cisco, um, but please don't hold that against me. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and seriously, thank you all for being here. You helped to prove my mom wrong. She said no one would show up, so take that mom. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Neutron L3 agent and some of the, uh, the things that I have done, both this employer, previous employers, elsewhere, whatever, to implement some HA as far as that goes. Um, so kind of the first thing that I wanna touch on and I wanna make absolutely clear here is that I don't think there's any one right way to do this. Um, I'm sure that y'all have different ways that you may or may not be doing it, but I, you know, mostly I just keep hearing about Pacemaker um, and like that's a fine implementation in some cases, but um, I don't feel like it's the only way to do it. So I wanted to offer up kind of what we're doing and maybe if we have some time at the end, talk about maybe what other people are doing as well. Um, so at the end of the day, the goal is just, you know, you gotta move these L L3 resources, these IP addresses to new L2 resources as quickly and seamlessly as possible. And that's more difficult than it might seem, um, but it's like a really, really important problem to solve. Um, so, Start at layer three, this is where internet happens. And that's sometimes a good thing, sometimes not. So my beautiful drawing here, you have, um, in a typical setup, you know, you might have multiple L3 agents running and all of them host different routers and craziness going on. Like you can see router one over there, some tenant apparently created a router and just wanted to use up some of their quota without actually using it. Um, so, this is what, it, this is what nor a normal setup will look like. So when you have a router fail, or sorry, an L3 agent fail, you have these routers that are left over and these guys here and they've got nothing, they've got nowhere to go. So, so what, do you end up, what do you end up doing with these things? Um, and that's really the problem that we're trying to solve is where do you put them? So layer two is what we actually have to deal with. And um, as you can see, the ARPing, that's definitely the hardest part. Um, so by and large, one L3 resource can only be tied to a single L2 resource at a time. You have one IP and one Mac, and that's kind of the end of it. Um, and if you wanna change that pairing, you gotta tell the switch what to do otherwise. So there's some technologies that exist that sort of try to work around this, like HSRP, VRRP, CARP, basically various iterations of ARP and RP. Um, and we're even working on implementing, um, we being the OpenStack community, are working on implementing some VRP-like functionality in Juno, and there's a, there's a, a, a blueprint for that. Um, but in the short term, there really, there's nothing integrated in OpenStack today that kind of gives a seamless layer three, layer two failover. So when those routers are out there orphaned, they don't have anywhere to go, and there's no way to quickly move them anywhere else. Um, so again, sort of what I touched on is pacemaker is sort of the default, um, is the default that everybody, that everybody goes to and you can see the docs, the docs site automatically sort of takes you there. Um, some problems that I had with pacemaker were, um, the last time I used it to be full disclosure here, the last time that I tried to implement pacemaker was with Nova Network still. And um, when we switched to quantum now neutron, I didn't even try to implement it because of these problems. But false positives were a huge problem that I had and maybe I just suck at tuning pacemaker, I don't know, but um, I was causing, or it, I should say it was causing more downtime than actual outages. Like a false positive would happen, L3 agent would migrate to the, to the failover and there'd be an outage and people would be like, what's going on? And sometimes you would end up with, and I'll talk about this a little more later, but split brains where you've got, you know, routers that are on both agents and all kinds of craziness happening. Um, so that was one of the big problems that we had. Um, again, kind of split brain possibilities. Uh, we did, and we didn't really want to implement like a stoner thing because, you know, we were having enough false positives that that just caused even more trouble. And again, maybe I suck at pacemaker, I don't know, but. <laughs> That was the problem that I had. Um, another issue that I had was that it basically assumes control of the L3 agent start stop function. So um, by default, at least the way it's documented is, you know, you want Pacemaker to actually start your L3 agents and you don't want um, your init scripts to do it anymore. So you run into issues where you have to, you know, you can install the packages, but then you have to remove them from, the, from RCD and, you know, put it under control of Pacemaker. And, um, you know, it's totally doable when you're, when you're, uh, when you're, if you're doing it through Puppet or Chef or Ansible or whatever, but um, I don't know, it's just an extra step and it's like, why, right? Um, 
So limited horizontal scale, um, for me, I found that it was more difficult to run a bunch of active L3 agents. Um, and I'll kind of touch on this a little bit more, but um, mostly just because it, because it required entire service starts and stops, and it usually requires like a mirrored pair, if you will, of, um, of hosts. So you've got, you know, you've got these, these two hosts, these, this hardware that's just sitting there basically doing nothing. Um, so I kind of look at it as a, like a RAID 1 <laughs> of, of layer 3 functionality. Um, the active passive model requires more hardware. Um, and it really works on a per agent level. So you know, you've got n number of routers sitting on an agent, but Pacemaker really only knows about the agent. It doesn't really know about the routers on the agent. Um, so it doesn't really give you a very fine level of granularity. So as I said, I sort of akin to RAID 1, you have to have two pieces of hardware sitting there, and you may scale it out horizontally, but you've still, if you've got three L3 agent nodes, you really have six. Um, so, and you know, and that may be fine, and that may be what you want to do, and um, it certainly solves some issues, like capacity issues and stuff like that. But um, looking back at our diagram here, we see that, um, you know, basically what ends up happening is you lose your L3 agent, and then Pacemaker just fires up another one or moves those routers to another one or clones the resources over to another one. So you end up with the exact same layout, but, um, you know, this agent goes away and just comes right back on a different piece of hardware. So your layout looks, ends up looking exactly the same. Um, so after messing with this for a while, and like I said, Nova Networking was where we did it last, uh, didn't really want to try to deal with that again, so we thought, what's a better way that maybe we can approach this problem? So what we did was we created something we call the Neutron HA tool, and um, you can see it's part of the StackForge cookbooks currently. Uh, so I mean, it's out there, you can grab it. It's free and fun. Um, so a few of the things of it, it's API driven. So basically it uses native API calls to perform all of its functions. Um, so anything that the Neutron client supports, it can do. Um, it's meant you can run it externally from infrastructure, you can run it across site, whatever. Um, basically the way that it works is it runs and it checks the agent status from the API, and if it says an agent is down, it does some jitter checking and stuff like that. And it um, and if the if it determines that an agent is down and is actually down, then it effectively makes API calls. It says remove the routers from this agent, add them to a different agent, or reschedule them. The schedule then splays them out to whatever L3 agents are are available again, and everything is ideally hunky dory. Uh, doesn't always end up that way, but. <laughs> um, so it's easily extendable. It's, I mean, it's written in Python and it just uses the standard OpenStack, re uh, OpenStack libraries. But most importantly, it works on a per resource level, by which I mean, again, it gets a list of all of the, it uses the API to get a list of all of the routers that are living on an L3 agent. And then it actually just moves them one router at a time. So you're not trying to deal with, you have the granularity of dealing with a per router basis instead of dealing with a per agent basis. Um, so again, going back to this beautiful diagram. So if we lose that L3 agent in the middle, this is what'll end up happening after the HA tool determines that it's gone. It'll just reschedule them onto L3 agents that, were, that are still alive. Um, so I would, you know, going back to kind of the RAID analogy, I would say this is more like a RAID 5 or a RAID 6. Like you have this parity laying around over here and over here, and if you lose a disk, you just, Say, well, that disk is gone, I'll replace it when I can. I'm gonna move my data to disks that are still valid and good and happy. Um, so one of the nice things is like only routers and IPs that are on the affected L3 agents are impacted. So when you're, in my experience, when you're stopping and starting L3 agents, you always, you always run the risk of something crazy happening. So in this case, it pulls the routers off and this splays them back out. Um, onto other things, and so, I mean, you're dealing with a per router basis, and with the L3, with the pacemaker stuff, when you restart an L3 agent, it, you know, it'll have to take all of the routers on it, and then it takes a while for them to come back up, um, which is still kind of a problem with this, but because it splays them out across your available L3 agents, you sort of parallelize that workload and the, the time that it takes for that recovery. So if you have 100 routers and 100, you know, on a failed agent, and you have 100 more that are laying around, it'll take far less time to bring them all back up. Um, so again, the recovery time depends on the number of routers and the number of IPs on each router. Um, mostly that's because the migration happens pretty quickly, but the routers have to re-ARP every IP to the, upstreams, to the upstream switch. So, um, and again, it's back to that layer two problem. 
And because we don't have VRRP or something like that, we got to tell the switch, hey, everybody, we're over here now. Um, the metadata proxies migrate with the routers. So, you know, it basically just sort of moves things along. So what is the catch? There are many of them. It certainly is not the best solution that has ever been invented by man. Um, it's not seamless. Again, it doesn't use some manner of Mac cloning or, you know, VIPs and anything like that. So there is downtime. Router dis or the agent disappears, router loses connectivity. It takes X amount of time before it comes back up somewhere else. Um, in Neutron now, so prior to Havana in Grizzly, the, this was actually a serial process, but now the ARPs will happen sort of in parallel, like it'll just do them as fast as it could. Um, I can remember one of the biggest things that I hated doing was restarting an L3 agent because you'd be like watching the log and it's like ARPing, 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 and it'd just take forever. Um, and again, the more IPs, the more floating IPs that were up there and running and stuff like that, the longer that took. But now stuff happens in parallel. Uh, generally, in my, in my testing, um, I haven't done more than a, like maybe 1,000 floating IPs migrating off of from one agent to another, but it usually takes 60 to 90 seconds once the migration starts happening. Um, the various as-a-service offerings, they further complicate things. So like, for instance, it only accounts for L3 agent-controlled services right now. Um, Load balancers of service is another really interesting example, like um, just that comes to mind because I was looking at that recently and like there's no, currently there's no API call to be able to remove a load balancer from one agent and move it to another. So like that's another kind of a catch like that sort of exemplifies this. Like you can only, you can only do the stuff that the API does. So it certainly gives you some issues there. Um, there's no coordination between the HA tools, so how do you HA the HA? Um, you know, you can have a tool running here and another one over there. They detect an agent down, you're gonna have lots of race conditions. Um, so that's something I'm sort of working on at the moment. Um, and if anybody has any ideas, I'd love to hear them. <laughs> but uh, it's currently not daemonized, and like, so the way, we, the way we have run it is it just runs from cron. So that means thinking worst case scenario, you have to add 60 seconds to your total recovery time if you have it running every minute. Um, and then you have the jitter protection, which adds additional total recovery time. And then you also have the issue where if your jitter, like so the way that the jitter works now is you give it a minimum and a maximum time and it does a RAN between those two. Um, and then it just rechecks to make sure the agent is actually still down before it does the migrations. And if it comes back up, then it says, okay, cool, it's fine. Um, and if it doesn't, then it, then it triggers the migration. But um, if you, if your jitter protection and your 60 second protection and stuff like that, if all of that stuff overlaps, there's a possibility it can run more than once at a time, uh, which hasn't been a problem in the past because you know, like the first one will kick off and it'll start looking for it'll start looking for agents to migrate, and then the second one will kick off and stuff. And they tend to they tend to behave pretty well, but it's certainly something that needs to be called out, um, just because again, race conditions abound in this particular scenario. Um, and then, and this is sort of a problem with Pacemaker as well, but there's no mechanism by which to ensure that the resources actually come back up. So, you know, you may migrate a router and, you know, if, if the router stays on the dead L3 agent the next time the tool runs, it's going to, um, it's gonna try to move it again if it's still there. But if it actually gets removed from this agent and then never comes up properly on this agent over here, you're not really gonna know about it and until the tenant says, hey, how come I can't get to any of my IPs or my VMs won't route or something like that. Um, and again, that's a problem that you have with the, elf, or sorry, with the pacemaker also. So it, you know, it's, but again, something that you wanna call out. Um, cool, so DHCP, sort of a layer three thing. So I figured I would uh, talk about that just briefly. Um, it's not really included in this because DHCP agents can be run in active-active mode already. Uh, you can run you know, like a ton of them. Um, and you basically just say, how many do you want specified in your agent config file and it'll spin up two or three or five. Um, one thing to keep in mind with that though is that each agent requires an IP in the tenant subnet. So if they create, I don't know, like a, a slash 30 or something like that, you're gonna take up, and you're, and you're running 10 DHCP agents, you're gonna <laughs> take up a good lot or all of their space. Um, cider math in my head is not my forte, so. Um, let's see here, okay, so DHCP is multicast, so again, that's why it works to have them all. Um, it just like broadcasts out and everything is, everything is happy. All the agents have the same lease files. Um, I've sort of been working on this a little bit with the guys upstream. 
Um, and so just the first one to reply binds to the VM, and, uh, and they'll all resolve. So like, and there's a, a patch just got submitted now, so it, the resolve.conf, unless the tenant specifies otherwise, will get all of the DHCP agents that are running um, as name servers in its resolve.conf. And they can all resolve all of the IPs internally and all recurse upstream. So um, yeah, so any DHCP agent can do that. Um, and then, yeah, by default, they'll each hand out a list of every agent as an available resolver. Um, the one thing that we do do in the HA tool is currently has an option to replicate DHCP to all of the agents. So if you get, you know, if you change the, if you change the value or you just want to say, I really want to spin up a lot of DHCP agents without going through and dealing with it, you can, um, you can run the tool and there's a, an option to replicate DHCP. Um, it also has a dry run option and some other things, so it'll tell you what it's going to do. Um, all right, so moving forward, so this is, so that's, that's kind of the end of what we did with the HA tool. That was one implementation that we looked at as opposed to trying to deal with Pacemaker. Um, so moving forward, what is Neutron doing? Well, we're implementing VRP-like functionality. Um, you can basically specify the number of active L3 agents per subnet, and it'll set it up. It uses uh, contract D and keep alive D, I think. Um, and really, where this factors into things is, what's the point of diminishing returns for my HA tool for pacemaker for whatever? Like, how much time is it worth spending implementing things? And which is pretty much why I came to the conclusion that all of those caveats and things like that, at least so far, for, me, for, for my scenario are an acceptable risk. Because um, it's like, well, if we're going to get something eventually, I'm just trying to get a stopgap, good is good enough. It'd probably be better to call it a DR tool <laughs> rather than an HA tool. Um, so however, this is the beauty of open source. And I just, like, I really wanted to touch on this again is that, you know, there's no run right way to do it one right way. My goodness, I can't talk today. Um, so it's good to think outside the box and to do cool things and you know, come up with ways to do it. Like Just because you read that Pacemaker is the way to do it or that this HA tool is the way to do it or whatever, that doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it. Um, so I would encourage everybody to uh, think about your scenarios, think about what you've got going on, and, and look at creative ways to solve problems, and then come back and I'll come listen to your talk about how you've made this better or whatever. Um, cool. So any questions, any comments, any if anyone want to tell me why I'm wrong? If not, the sound guy said if we could get out of here early, that's good. So I'm just kidding. I don't think I've had to answer that. Um, I might answer that question because we have been working on something very similar. Like, uh, we've been uh, uh, enhancing the HA tool that you are also using, upstreaming some changes, and then we added a pacemaker resource agent for the HA, uh, yeah, for the HA tool to monitor everything and also take care of restarting the agents. Yeah, it's all upstream. Well, the, the resource agent is still a uh, pull request only on the upstream repositories, but it's here. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, there, there certainly is work being done. Like I say, from my perspective, the issues that I see, I didn't want to spend more time trying to eke out a little more performance. For me, it's been good is good enough. And given, like, the, like I say, the hopefully seamless failover and stuff that's coming up, I hadn't spent specific time on that. Yeah. Uh Instead of just uh, king more L3 agents when they die, I was thinking to have shooting more L3 agent based on the traffic. So uh, in our use case, when we support eScience users, where the where the where the traffic goes up, I mean they, they download a lot of data, scientific data. So I was thinking to launch uh, more L3 agents on demand, like when the spike goes up, they launch more L3 agent and then balance it. Right. So is there any way to do that or something? Yeah, I mean, not in the not in the tooling that we've created today. Um, the way that we've looked at that is we basically kind of again along the looking at the RAID level thing. Like I have a number of of L3 agents running, and when they get to a certain capacity, 
um, based on how many are running and how many routers we have and stuff like that, we, we spin up more physical hardware. We're not currently doing anything in virtual hardware. Um, but did, I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, yeah, so, we're, so I'm not working on getting anything to spin up agents automatic, more like build new agents automatically, but that certainly is a really good idea. And for people running virtual infrastructure, control infrastructure, that would, that would be really amazing. Like you could implement like heat or something like that to spin up automatically expand out your L3 infrastructure. Good comment, thank you. What do you think the uh, behavior of the L3HA structure would be if your DHCP configuration always contains two V routers for every VM's routing table? It's a really good question. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. I'm not, I'm not actively working on some of the upstream stuff. I'm more working on some other things at the moment, so. Um, that's a really good question. I really don't have an uh, answer. For you. My first consideration is it would probably increase the load if you ended up with two V routers for the same VM going on the same L3 agent. Right, and I would have to imagine that there's got to be some kind of, like in the code when it finally gets written, like in the scheduler code, where are we going to put things? That that'll probably be a consideration. Um, if not, we should definitely look at the blueprints and make sure that it does. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Good comment. Uh, the community is working on the distributed virtual router, right? There's uh, some work on. Ongoing, I guess they are pushing it to the next release. So, how is this thing compared to the distributed virtual router? Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Changbin. The, the Neutron guys are working on the distributed virtual router, uh, like FA right. for L3 agent, right? So, so okay. I just wonder how is this thing compared to the DVR's distributed virtual router? Um, well, I mean, I sort of consider this to be like a, a third party bolted on try to fix it solution, so it probably has nothing to do with what people are working on. I was more going for like a, what can we do today in Grizzly and Havana to sort of overcome the shortcomings? What are some ideas? Um, so I would say it has nothing to do with, with what's being worked on later. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes, sir. How is the DHCP lease file shared? Well. Sorry, what, it, how is it checked by the DHCP agents? How, how is it shared? Yeah, because you said that there's one lease file for all the agents, right? Right. So anytime, um, currently the way that it works is that anytime a new VM is spun up or the lease file gets changed, like it pulls from the database the entire lease file for that, or the entire like list of VMs for that subnet and rewrites out the file from scratch. Anyone else? All right, well, I really appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. I, hopefully you learned something, and if you didn't, then hopefully it wasn't a complete waste of your time. <laughs> Thanks, you guys.